to declare. Amen. A God we serve, right? Amen. 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 Well, what a great time of worship. How many of you were touched? Your hearts touched this morning. Amen. So important. Our hearts can melt, right? <clears throat> In the presence of God. Well, today I want to talk about uh, spiritual gifts. Uh, Pastor Rihanna asked me to talk about that. And I'm not really going to talk about the gifts themselves very much. I'm going to talk about the purpose, the plan, and the power of spiritual gifts. And I really want to create, hopefully, a, a desire and a motivation to, to be used by God. Amen. That's my purpose. Amen. Isn't it nice to receive a gift? How many of you like receiving gifts? <laughs> All of us like to receive a gift, right? And uh, how many of you have, had a, have a birthday this month? Anyone have a birthday? Well, happy birthday. Anyone else? Ellen. <laughs> Ellen? Okay, a couple birthdays this month. And, and uh, Christmas time, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Valentine's Day, we always receive gifts. And we have some understanding about gifts. Um, gifts are given out of relationship. Amen. Right? Gifts are given out of relationship. We give to people that we know. We, we normally don't walk up to a stranger, someone we don't know, hey, it's Christmas time, I want to give this to you. Now, I know this church blesses strangers with gifts at Christmas time because we want to give to others. But normally we don't do that. Gifts are given out of relationship. And it's out of a relationship with God that gifts are given and they are released. Now, I, I heard a story of a, a student who was, uh, she was a waitress and uh, she was planning on taking a mission trip and she needed some money. And there were four businessmen there, and somehow they got on the conversation of her mission trip. And these mission, these uh, businessmen decided to pay, they didn't know her, to pay for her mission trip. Not only that, they decided to pay for a school bill. They paid everything. Can you imagine? Now that's a miracle. <laughs> a miracle gift. But gifts are given out of relationship. Second thing we understand about gifts, uh, gifts are freely given. Right? It's a gift. It's free. I wouldn't walk up to, to Miss Rihanna and give her a gift and then say, Now, Miss Rihanna, you can cash out me $20 for this gift. It costs me $20, right? No, we understand that gifts are given freely. We're going to look at that in the gifts of God. And the third thing about gifts is that gifts are intended to be a blessing. Gifts are intended to be a blessing. When I give, when I'm thinking of getting a gift for someone, I don't look for something in my house that I don't want. I don't run to the Salvation Army and look for something that's used and broken, right? When we think of giving a gift, we think of being a blessing to that person. And so we've all experienced it, and that's part of the spiritual gifts that we're going to look at today. And so I want to lay a foundation today on, on gifts. And let's begin, uh, Ms. Rihanna had this verse last week, Psalm 139 in verse 7, or I'm sorry, Psalm 39, verse 14 and 15. I think I gave that scripture for you guys to show. And this is very foundational in understanding gifts. It says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them that full, full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. We understand from Psalm 139 that God created us in a unique way. That God created us with purpose. God created us with a plan. Amen. Did you know that from the foundation of the world, God had you in mind? Did you know that? Yes, you were in his mind. And when he made, when he made you and he fashioned you, he, he fashioned you with a purpose. He fashioned you to put things within you that would show forth his purpose. And we can see this even in the, in the creation of Lucifer. Do you know when Lucifer was created, we know that he is the fallen angel. Um, it says in Ezekiel, it says... 
The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Lucifer was created with this musical instruments within him because I believe probably he was part of the worship of heaven. He had to have a lot of influence because he deceived one third of the, of the angels to follow him. So we see that even Lucifer was created with these gifts to glorify God. Amen. And that Lucifer, the mistake was, was to take those gifts as his own. And pride entered in. You know, that's a danger of the gifts. There's a danger when God uses us in the gifts that we think we're somebody, that we think we have the gift, that this gift is mine. Do you know that the gift is not yours? It's from God. But Lucifer had those within him. And just like Lucifer, God has put within us, each of us are uniquely created by God, specifically with purpose, and he has put things within us that he wants to come forth from us. And so that's a beautiful thing as we look at that. Now, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So one of the things that the enemy tries to do is he tries to attack your identity. And it happened in my life. When I, when I came to Bible school, I battled with this one thing. I didn't like myself. In fact, I, I got mad at God and I said, God, why did you make me this way? Why am I so quiet? I want to be like this person over there. They're outgoing, and, you know. And so I was wrestling with God, and God spoke to me from Isaiah 45. It says, how can the clay say to the potter, what have you made? That's what God spoke to me. God made me with purpose. God made me a quiet person. That's just who I am. I'm quiet. And I've accepted the, the way God has made me. And I, there was a scripture in, in James that says, a quiet spirit is precious in the sight of God. And God spoke to me. A quiet spirit is precious in my sight. This is the way I've made you. Accept it, and you will be a blessing to others. Accept the way you are made, and you will be a blessing to others. And so the enemy, he attacks your identity to, to attack your purpose to attack your purpose. Because, see, it's your identity, the way he made you, is where your purpose comes from. So if he can attack your identity where you don't like certain things about yourself, then he attacks your purpose. Your purpose will not come from it. So we need to accept ourselves and know that uh, back in 1982, Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God to help me with my identity. And so... We are uniquely made. Number two, understanding our purpose is Isaiah 43, verse 7. This is another scripture. We were made by God to glorify him. Look what it says. Everyone who is called by my name, who I have created for what? My for glory. my glory. Did you know that you, are, you have been created with purpose and for the glory of God? You have been created for the glory of God. That through your life, his glory would shine. Shine into a world that is in, in darkness. And so we are created for the glory of God. And to have that glory be manifested, we must be in relationship with him. And we must allow our lives to be used for him. If, if we live for ourselves, you know, it's not about the great American dream. It's about God's dream for your life. I don't live for the American dream. A lot of people come to America because the great American dream. It's not about the American dream. It's about God's dream and plan for your life. And that's what we must follow. That's where you will be blessed. That's where God will use you. That's where God will be glorified in your life. When you follow his dream, he has a dream. And how do you know his dream sometimes is higher than our dream? Amen. My ways are higher than your ways. Amen. Right? His ways are higher. Sometimes we can't even understand his ways and what he's doing in our life. But his ways are higher and good. Now, I remember when I gave my life to Christ back in 1981. Before I gave my life to Christ, I was talking to, to God, and I was saying, God, 
Why did you create me? Why am I on this earth? This is, I was just crying out because I was lost. And it was some months later in a Bible study in a small town, Catholic town, where I heard the gospel for the first time. I was raised Catholic. And I went home that night and I said, God, I give you my life and I will go anywhere you want me to go and I will do anything you want me to do. Eight months later, guess where I was? <laughs> Christ the nations. <laughs> Eight months later, I was in this place. Two years later, I was married to the young lady over there. So <laughs> one year later, I was on the mission field. Can you imagine from going to a place, I don't know where, what I'm doing in this life, Lord, to giving my life to God, to finding his purpose, come to Christ for the nations. I'm going to introduce you to a girl named Solange. And then you're going to go to her island. Who would have dreamed such a thing? I couldn't have dreamed such a thing. But you see, God's ways for our life are so great as we follow him. All we, it's, it's not difficult. He says, follow me. He said to Peter, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. As we follow him, <coughs> his dream for our life, we will find his purpose unfolding before us. And that's the great thing. Now, what does the word gift mean in the uh, Greek language? We have 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where it's introducing the gifts of the Spirit. If we get the Greek word is the, um, charis where we get the word charismatic, charismata, I don't even know how to pronounce that. It doesn't matter. When we get the word charismatic, um, how many of you here would remember the charismatic movement? <laughs> Some of you would. That was started in the 70s, right? And it was amazing. I got saved in the early 80s, and it was kind of ending. But I remember God moving in these traditional churches. Remember, I was raised in it. It was a Catholic town. And I was, I was getting these uh, cassette tapes from these priests who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That God was using in miracles and healings and nuns getting filled with the Holy Spirit and God using them. The, the gifts were being revived in the church, not only the church, but the traditional churches, the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, the Catholic church. God was baptizing them in the Holy Spirit and the gifts were flowing. And it was an amazing time. Now, the word gift means it's a grace, grace gift that's freely given. You know that it's a grace gift. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. It's the spirit that distributes the gifts. Now, we should earnestly desire them, but it's the spirit that distributes the gift. So it's a free gift that God has given us, and each one is given different gifts. We're gonna, I'm just going to mention those later in the, uh, in the message. But it's a free gift of grace. How many know that the, the walk, the Christian walk is a walk of grace? It is. We're saved by grace. We walk by his grace. His, his grace, you know, when we stumble and when we fall at the blood of Jesus, which is the grace of God, it picks us up every time. Everything is by, it's by grace in God. And the scripture reveals that we will be held accountable for what has been given to us. Did you know that? Did you know there, there's coming a day that each one of us will stand before the, before the uh, judgment seat of Christ? Now the judgment seat of Christ is not a place where we're going to be judged for sin. That's where we're saved, we're washed in the blood. But it's a place where we're gonna go before God with our works. What have we done with our life? And we'll stand before God. And everything that we've done for ourselves or for selfish ambition, selfish motives, those things will be like wood and straw, they'll be burnt up. But everything that is done for the glory of God, it shall remain, it shall be about like gold and silver, and it shall be our reward. And so the Bible talks about this accountability. 
And Jesus used the parable of the talents. Some of you remember the parable of the talents. Isn't it interesting that the word talents is kind of a play on words? Yeah. Because when we think of talents, we think of uh, a lot of the things that we witness today. Uh, those who can play the keyboard and, and sing, those are different talents, artistic talents, where the Tom has that. Um, we think of those talents, but those are also giftings, right? But the talents, it was money. And, and so we had one person, remember the story? He was given five talents. What did he do with those five talents? He produced five more. He invested them wisely. Another one was given two talents. And he took those two talents and he invested them wisely and bought, brought back profit. And one was given the one talent. And what did that one, what did the person that got the one talent, what did he do with it? He buried it. Why did he bury it? Because he was afraid. He was afraid. Do you know that fear is the one thing that the enemy used to keep you from being, releasing your gifts and talents? It's fear. And the Bible shows this. There was a young pastor by the name of Timothy. How many remember Timothy? He was, he was uh, Paul's young son in the Lord. And Timothy was a young pastor. And Timothy was having struggles. He was, I believe, probably intimidated as a young, uh, as a young pastor. And something amazing in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. I want you to see this. And I want you to see how... Fear was trying to steal or rob Timothy from operating in his gifts. Look what it says. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is given to you through the laying on of hands. Another verse says, talk about stir up the gifts, Timothy. Why is Paul encouraging Timothy to stir up the gifts? What's going on with Timothy? What is he facing? Now look at verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You see, it was fear that was causing Timothy to shrink back from the gifts of God in his life. And Paul had to encourage him, Timothy, don't be intimidated. Another, uh, that word fear means intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Don't shrink back. God has called you. Don't be afraid to use what God has used you. Be bold, be strong, right? And go forward. And maybe for some of us here today, maybe we have been intimidated by things in our life. And we've shrunk back from allowing God to use us. And maybe out of fear. You know, I remember the first time I prophesied. How many of you know that God wants us to prophesy on as Ms. Rainer was asking, does anyone have a word, right? Desire to prophesy. And I remember the first time, the first thing, what if I say the wrong thing, yes. right? We don't want to give the word because we're afraid out of fear. And I remember the first time I did it and, and I gave the word and the word was part of the pastor's message. <laughs> So it was a good confirmation for the Lord to encourage me. You did hear from me, son. Don't be afraid to speak when I tell you to speak. So I'd like to encourage all of us here today. If the Lord gives you a word, even if it's one sentence, God doesn't want you to be afraid. That's my word. And you go sit down. That's the word the Lord gave you. So let's, let's let the Lord use us as we gather and worship. Amen. Because the Lord wants to use you. He has put gifts within you. And so let's, let's let the Lord use us in that. Um, the gifts are not for you. Say with, say with me, the gifts are not for me. The gifts are not for me. Now, if I were to give you this gift today, there's nothing in it, by the way. If I were to give you this gift today, it would be for you. Right? When you get your birthday gift, it's for you. But when God gives us a gift, it's not for us. It blesses us in the fact 
that we experience God using us. That's the blessing we get. There's a joy in blessing when God uses us Amen. and when God works through us. We receive a satisfaction and a blessing. But the gift is a blessing for others. The gift is a blessing for others. And Jesus made this statement in Matthew 20, verse 28. I think we have that verse. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay his, give his life for many as a ransom. Yeah. Jesus came to be a blessing for others. And guess what? We're in Christ. We're to imitate Christ. And to imitate Christ, we are to be a blessing for others. Now, one day I was, I was on the island of Curacao, and I worked with the follow-up team. We would follow up people who came to church, people who gave their lives to Christ. We would go follow them up. And I, I started this follow-up group. It was a funny thing. It was me and about 15 older ladies in the church. And one time we were out eating, and they said, there's your hair. You know, they were teasing me. But 15 older ladies. And these, these ladies were just on fire for God and had a heart to serve. And so one day we were supposed to go out, and I was just struggling with things and, you know, how we can have our own personal battles and there could be different things going on in our life. And I said, Lord, I really don't want to go out today. I don't want to go out. I'm just struggling with these things. And can I have a day off? Oh, no, you've got to go. So I forced myself to go. And, you know, after spending time with a few people, I realized my problems were not that bad. And I came back with joy because I was able to encourage others. Right. You see, God wants us to encourage us even in our times of need. That's how, that's how sometimes we come out of it. We come out of things by encouraging others in our time of need. And so I learned that lesson. So we are, we are called to serve others. The gifts are for others to bless others. And there's a joy in that. There's a great joy in that. It's more blessed to give than to receive. The gift is not boasting for me. The gift is to make his name great. That has to be the motivation. You know, we must walk in humility. If we want to walk in the power of God, you've got to walk in because humility says, God, without you, I can do nothing. But God, with you, I can do all things. That's humility. A recognition of who we need, but a recognition yet of what we can do through him. We need both. Walking in humility will bring forth the power of God. If we want the power of God, we, we recognize that, hey, without you, I am nothing. Right? We're poor in spirit. And so the purposes of the gift, the purposes of the gift is found in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, and I like this. And this is what we are to experience on a Sunday morning. This is what God wants when his body comes together. And this morning I can tell you that everyone here today, you have different needs. You're facing different challenges. You're facing different battles. All of us, how I many you know when we wake up in the morning, God is there, but the enemy is there to discourage us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some of you, maybe this morning, you came discouraged. You're facing something in your life, and you came discouraged. And the purpose of the body coming together, and the purpose of the gifts is listed right here. Look at the three things. But everyone who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. That is the purpose of the gifts. The gifts are not to condemn you, to judge you, to put you down. And that's how you can discern when someone is operating in a gift, if it is of the Lord or if it is of the flesh. And I remember as a student, and it was great when I was sitting back in the early 80s, we used to, the gifts used to flow during the chapel time, tongues and interpretation. And we'd have this rise of worship. And then it would come down, and then there would be silence, and then the word would come forth. 
He was beautiful. I remember this guy, maybe I shared this from South Africa. Um, he spoke in King James language back then, of course we all did. But thus saith the Lord, you know. But it was powerful, I remember. But then I remember a time that someone went in error, and it was a good lesson. While, while the worship goes up, it comes to this quietness. Someone runs to the drum set. And while we're all, our eyes are closed, everything is just beautiful presence of the Lord. He takes the drumsticks and goes, clang, clang, clang. He hits the cymbals, and he says, you are all like clanging cymbals. It was a word of condemnation. And the drums clanging put fear in everyone. So the leader comes up and he said, well, that uh, brother, that was just not from the Lord. And, uh, and so, so when we prophesy and when we move in the gifts, it's for strengthening, encouraging, and comforting. How many of you know that's the heart of God for you every day? Amen. Every day you wake up, the heart of God is to strengthen you, encourage you, and comfort you. The Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that he's the God of all comfort who comforts us. Now let, listen to what it says. He is the God of all comfort who comforts us in our distress. Now it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop and say, oh, I comfort you. Then he says this, with the same comfort that I have comforted you, go comfort others. You see, Whatever trial you're going through today, it's not a waste. It's not like, oh, Lord, why did I have to go through this? The Lord uses everything, what the enemy uses against us, to punch the enemy back in the nose. Did you know that? That when you go through a trial, how many of you have been through a trial where the Lord has spoke to you scriptures? The Lord has encouraged you. The Lord has brought hope to you. The Lord has comforted you with that same comfort, God says, that I've given you in your distress. There's going to come a day when someone's going to walk down your pathway with the same problem. And you're going to minister to them because I minister to you in your hour of trouble. That's what God does. It's not a waste. It's not. God uses you know, the pain and the suffering that we go through in life, as we yield to the Lord, the Lord will use it. He will use it to comfort others. As God has poured oil and wine in your heart during difficult times, you will have an anointing on your life to pour into others. The oil and the wine refer to the anointing. And God anoints us to be a blessing for others. Now, it's hard sometimes when we're going through the challenge to see that, right? Or when we're in the midst of the battle, sometimes it's hard to see that. But I tell you today that God will use your difficulties. And there will come a day when you will have a testimony that you will stand in front of people and you will testify of the goodness of God and what he has done in your life. And your testimony will touch hearts that are burdened and broken. That's how God uses us. So, let's talk a minute about the power of spiritual gifts. That was the plan and the purpose. And God is so wonderful to choose us. You know, how many of you have seen the sign if you drive down the highway? We buy ugly houses. How many of you have seen that before? Okay, we buy ugly houses. Hey, no, what do they got? Why do they buy ugly houses? Well, they buy ugly houses because they have a vision for ugly houses. That vision is to restore and make a profit. God is in the business of buying ugly houses. And our houses are pretty ugly in sin. <laughs> All of us. And God purchased this with his blood. Not to make a profit off of our life but to glorify his name through our life. He has purchased each one of us with his blood, with all our ups and downs and difficulties and challenges and mistakes and problems, everything. When God purchased you, he, he knew the problems that you had in your life. 
but he purposed he purchased you with vision that through the power of the Holy Spirit he could transform your life and glorify his name. That's a beautiful thing. Let's take a look at the power of spiritual gifts. So there are in the Bible, New Testament, we have three listings of spiritual gifts. And I want to show you how the power of God flows through these three listings. The first is found in Romans 12, <clears throat> in verse uh, 5 to 8, I believe. And I think Ms. Rihanna touched on a few of them uh, last week. These are what I call, right now, if you're taking notes, the functional gifts. These are the functional gifts. And the functional gifts <clears throat> are for the body to function together. And if I look out here, I can see some of those gifts, and I see them functioning. And the power of God operates when everyone functions in their gift. And so as we function in our gift, the power of God causes the church to move forward. Amen. It causes the church. And what are the functional gifts? Um, in Romans 12, it talks about um, those who are uh, administrators and leaders. And I think of Sandy as, a, as the administrator. I would not be a good administrator. It's hard. Not that I can't administrate, but it's not my gift. So when it's your gift, everything has to be in order. How do you know we need order in the church? Huh? We need order in the church. Then it talks about the gift of the teacher, the teaching. To him who teach, let him teach. And Brother Nicky is, is, a, is a, a gifted teacher and, and blessed. We need teachers in the body to function so that we can grow. Then the gift of serving, those who serve. There are those who just, they're kind of like Martha. All they want to do is serve, right? And then she got mad. Mary, why don't you want to serve with me, right? Yeah. There are those who love to serve. They want to serve. It's just God put that within them. Right. Then there's the gift of encouragement. Those who encourage. <clears throat> Encouragement, Sister Pearl. I thank you as a, a mighty encourager in the Lord. And that gifting is important. You know, she'll come up and give a fiery word and everyone will be up and, wow, I'm encouraged, right? Mm -hmm. You have the gift of giving. Those who love. Now, let me, let me just say this. We all need to serve. We all need to give. It. We cannot say, well, since I don't have the gift of serving, I'm not going to clean the toilets today. I just don't feel called to toilet cleaning. That's not my calling. Sorry, brother. One of the greatest pre preachers from Africa what was his name, guys? Nevers Mumba. Wasn't he cleaning toilets here? Yes, he was. He was, <laughs> he was cleaning toilets at the end of life. So, don't expect to do the big things if you're not willing to do the little things, right? So you have the servers, the givers, the exhorters, the one who prophesies. All these are functional gifts that operate. Now, here's the question you might have. How do I know my gift? How many ask that question? How do I know what my gift is? Well, how do you know? And I came up with a little saying here. You know as you grow. You can never know the gifts of God if you don't grow in the Lord. As you grow, you know. As you grow in the Lord, others will see the giftings in you. But if we don't grow in the Lord, guess what? You won't know. <clears throat> and others won't know. Others may see things. But as you grow, you know. So as you grow in the Lord, God is going to put things in your heart to do. You know, as I was growing in the Lord, I just had a desire to teach. It was <clears throat> one of my desires as, as I was growing in the Lord. So as you grow, you know. <clears throat> so the functional gifts... The power of the functional gifts is when we all begin to operate in the body gifts. And all of us have that. The second list of gifts is found in Ephesians 4. And I'm going to call these the equipping gifts. The equipping gifts. We have the apostle, the prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, right? The fivefold ministry. These are men and women that God called to equip the saints, to equip the saints.
To equip them for what? What are they to be equipped for? To go to heaven? No, for the work of the ministry. <laughs> for the work of the ministry. So you come to Bible school, there's a lot of uh, men and women here who have these, have these gifts. And they operate to equip us. So they have equipping, anointing, and power on them to equip an army for God. Amen? That's their purpose, to equip an army for God. The power of God working through the gifts, through the equipping gifts. And then the last list of gifts would be the spiritual gifts found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And those are actually power gifts. Now, I remember back in the 80s, a lot of the, uh, some churches did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I remember those days. How many of you remember those days when they said it's of the devil? Yeah. Some still say that. <laughs> they said it's of the devil. They said, well, we don't need these gifts anymore. We've got the word of God. That's all we need. Well, if the disciples needed it, how much more do we need them today? The gifts have not ceased, but the gifts are alive and well, and God wants them to flow in this hour. Amen. He wants them to flow. And so I remember this, this guy, I was, when we uh, graduated here, we went to work at the counseling center for a year before we went to the island. And this guy comes in, he's, he's from one of those churches. He said, my pastor always told me the baptism of the Holy Spirit is of the devil. I said, well, I think you need to receive it. And so he goes, okay. So I taught him on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said, next week, because our time was up, I said, next week you come back, I'm going to pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So here's this guy, taught all his life, speaking in tongues is from the devil. So he comes the next week, but his heart is open to receive. And I lay my hands on him. As Paul said, you know, he laid his hands on them and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I lay my hands on him. And he starts breathing. I said, well, hey, what's going on? I feel something here. I said, well, let it go. There it came, speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He comes back the next week. He said, man, I couldn't sleep all night. I prayed in tongues all night. <laughs> you see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the entrance into the power gifts. It's the entrance into the power gifts. These power gifts are to testify that Jesus Christ is God. I have a good friend who graduated from Christ for the Nations who has done many crusades in Pakistan and India with millions of people coming to hear the gospel. And it's through the, through the gifts that testify to these people who believe in their Hindu gods that Jesus Christ is the living God. Through miracles that take place and so God wants us to believe to operate in these gifts. And he, and he says in these power gifts, desire these gifts. Desire them with the right motive, though, right? To glorify God, not to make a name for yourself. John the Baptist was considered the greatest prophet. Yet John the Baptist made this statement. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And... He must, Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. And that's the attitude that we must have if we want to be used by God. God, I don't want them to see me. It's not my name in lights. It's not John Trail Ministries. No, it's Jesus. And I, everything I do, I want to point to him. Because people will come to you to get you to point at yourself. Wow, look what you're doing. Look how God is using you. Wow. You are something else. And then you start listening to that. Say, yes, I am. I am something else. Look how God is using me. And you breathe in all that, and you get a big head, and then God has a way to pop it. <laughs> God has a way to humble us, right? And so the power of the gifts, as we function together, there's power. As we sit under the anointed 
equippers that God has called. And a pastor, if Pastor Rand is an equipper because she's called Pastor Tom as pastors, they are equippers to equip us. And then to operate. So let's, as we come on Sunday morning, come and just say, Lord, use me this Sunday. Use me. Maybe pray at home. Maybe the Lord will give you a word at home. And so if the call goes out, does anyone have a word? Step out in faith. Even if it's one word. Hope. My word today is hope. The Lord gave me the word hope. Step out in faith. And let the Lord use you. And in all that we do, let us be strengthening others, encouraging others, and comforting others. That is the ministry of Jesus, and that's the ministry he wants to flow through us. Now, maybe this morning, some of you just kind of feel dead. Maybe you've operated in gifts. Um, how many you know that circumstances can deaden our spirit? You get discouraged by something. Something doesn't go the way you plan. I mean, oh, sometimes we plan on our life, and those plans change. But has God changed for, our, for his purpose for our life? No. no. He hasn't. So maybe there's been discouragement. Maybe there's been fear. Maybe there's been, the enemy would have us focus inwardly so that nothing can flow outwardly. So we're, fo we're focusing inward on what we don't have. We're focusing inward on our struggles. And when we focus inward, then that which God would have flow us outward is stopped. And so we have to, we have to release some things whether it's discouragement, we talked about unforgiveness today. All those things are like having your arteries blocked and there's no flow, right? We want the Holy Spirit to flow. So we, we need to remove from our heart, from our lives, anything that would hinder that. Unforgiveness, discouragement, fear, anxiety. Maybe there's been a lot of anxiety in your life. And Jesus said, or Isaiah says, he who keeps his mind on him shall be in perfect peace. So we have to readjust our, our mind and our thoughts and set it on the things above and not on the things of the earth. Because no matter how you're feeling today, God's plan has not changed for your life. No matter what circumstances have come in your life, God's plan has not changed for your life. God has a plan for you. In fact, he says, I have a future and a hope for you. No matter what people have said about you, my word is above what other people have said. And so I want to I pray this morning. Maybe you're facing um, maybe some difficulties, struggles that have tried to overtake you. I want us to pray to, to have them broken, to the spirit of heaviness that can come upon our lives. When the spirit of heaviness is over our life, we don't see a future. We only see things dark. And that spirit of heaviness is not from the Lord, of course. The Lord wants to release that spirit of heaviness. If you came with the spirit of heaviness today, the Lord would release that from you. The Lord would release the spirit of discouragement over your life if you came into this place discouraged. He says in Isaiah 43.10, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will be with you. The word, the, the word of the Lord today is encouragement and strength and comfort. So this morning, as Rihanna comes to play on the keyboard, or if someone's going to play I want to ask today if you're facing, let's all stand this morning.
Surely the Lord wants to use us, but he's concerned about our hearts today, where we're at. Our relationship with him is not based upon performance. Yet he wants to heal Difficulties. Maybe the last week a lot of problems have come against you. And those problems have weighed you down. We want to pray that that would be released. Jesus said, Come to me, all ye that are heavy burdened, and I will give rest for your soul. He wants you to be at a restful place. So you here today, anyone would say, I, I need prayer today. Put your hand right now. You need prayer. If you want to come up, you can. We'll have some ladies here. I think there's more people here today. There's others here that you've been troubled. You've been heavy. So I just want to pray for you. fear keep you in your seat. But come this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you this morning for your presence. Thank you that you love us. You have called us with an everlasting love. You speak to our hearts this morning to be still and know that you are God. Be still and know that he is God. Know that he reigns over the earth. He reigns over your circumstances. He reigns over your life. He is Lord of all. So fear not. Do, do not be dismayed by what's taking place in the earth. Lord of all. Lord, I thank you for that this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For the Lord says that he will do a new thing. Shall it not spring forth? Do not think of the former things or the things of the past. Know that the Lord will bring refreshment to your spirit. He will bring rivers of water in the desert places of your heart. For the Lord would revive you out of a dead place and bring forth fruit in the barren land. Lord, I thank you today that that is your promise. That is your word. So Lord, I speak life to the barren places. Lord, in Jesus' name, let it come forth. Let it come forth. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
has never been filled with the Holy Spirit, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, would you just come up and receive the Holy Spirit? It makes such a difference. You may say, well, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, but Brother John explained today, there's more. There's another gift. Yes. Salvation is a free gift. Yes. We just say, yes, Lord, I want to be saved. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. But as you read in the book of Acts, there's a gift that goes beyond that, and that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you ask that the Spirit fill you, and that He will live in you, and when He does, you're transformed, you're changed in so many ways. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, just come on up and let Brother John pray for you. He has a gift for this. Hallelujah. Let's receive this Holy Spirit, the gift, the anointing. Hallelujah. I believe there's more than one. You need overcoming power. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You want to be a witness? You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When I received the Holy Spirit, this good little Methodist girl couldn't stop telling people about Jesus. I had a boldness I never had before because he filled me completely and then he changed me so amazingly. Come on and receive it if you've not received the Holy Spirit. But I 
had to learn that no matter what, he's a good God. And I had to choose and say, God, you are a good God, no matter what the circumstances. No matter what I'm going through, I choose to say that you are a good God. The enemy wants to distort our view of God. As we go through bad circumstances in life, he wants to distort our view of God. But he, God wants you to know he's a safe place. To come back and to see him as a good God. He is safe. Come. He loves you. Come. Make that decision. It's a decision. Spirit, 
yes. so ready to move in the gift that you put within us, yes. to encourage, to comfort, to exhort, and, and to lift up people, yes. that, Father, we're going to see people's lives change, and we're going to see people in our community change. We call for this nation, Lord. We want to make a difference in our nation. Yes. Some people have gifts in here. They can share through the Word or through television or radio. Many gifts are going to be now bursting open because yes. of you, Lord, yes. because of your fullness of your spirit. Yes. Today we say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. And we thank you that we have given everything we have to you. Thank you for healing happening in the community. Thank you for blessing these students who are coming onto the campus. Yes. Use our church to do it, Lord. Prayers of encouragement, ways of lifting people up as they come all the way from their homes to a place they do not even know, some of them, to study the Word of God. God, let us be an encouragement, we pray. Come on, Lord. We thank you for this church and what you're doing in us and what you're going to do through us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All together. And I live to worship you. Why don't you stand your feet and sing it one more time.